Hello, it's Brad here, and today what I'm going to be doing is looking at a multi-story design and showing you how exactly we come up with these drift values that you see. So I've got a, a mass file open here, four story, same cross section all the way. So you see I've got a 20 centimeter, 30 MPA block. The wall is fully grouted and I've got number 25s uh, spaced at 800. So you can see where they're placed here. If I zoom in, you can see the bar placement here. And if we go through and look at deflection now, we've applied some seismic loads and we've come up with these drift values. So what I'm hoping to help you out with today is answer the question of how exactly we come up with these values and how you can go ahead and check any sort of design that you're looking at at home. Now, before I get into this too much, I just want to point out that in uh, on the Help Files website, I do have some articles that I've put together trying to explain this as well. So um, this is on masonrydesign.ca. Um, we've got articles on basically any aspect of the software that you see here. So in particular, what I've got here is an article just on the individual element. So I've got it sort of summarized here, but if you go through this article, there's a lot of information here, but it's basically explaining how we come up with these drift values. Uh, first looking at elastic, breaking down the equations. Um, this is sort of the summary. Uh, one thing I just want to quickly touch on here is that I'm not going to be getting into how we come up with the effective stiffnesses. Uh, that's just uh, a bigger topic and it'd make this video far too long. So what I'm going to do is start from knowing that we have an effective stiffness to actually calculating an elastic deflection and then uh, the drift value from that. And since this is a multi-story example, this is the article that you see here for just the individual shear wall element. If I go to the multi-story, which I also have open, uh, you'll see that I have an article here. And I'm going to be referring to this uh, a little bit. It sort of talks about the differences between uh, looking at just one element at a time and the full um, multi-story and the other things you need to take into account. So to get back into it here with our mass file, I'll move this out of the way. Looking back at this file, what I have here is a successful design. And so when I go through and do this, what I'm going to do is do this by, um, I'm gonna do this by hand. I'm going to start by, let's see, I've got my pen here. So uh, what I'm going to do is start looking at just the base of the wall here. So at the very bottom, it, it, it might seem sort of backwards when we're looking at it, but it makes sense once I get started. So I'm going to start looking here at story one, the base of the wall. And what I need to start with before I start getting into any of this deflection business is the effective stiffness, and in particular, the effective bending stiffness. So I'm talking about this term EI effective. And to get that, what I am use is the effective moment of inertia, so IE, we multiply that by whatever the reference or the weakest strength is, so I'll do E reference here. And these values can be found in mass by, let's, let me switch over to the mouse here. If I look at any of these individual stories, I mean, you can see here, this is sort of a bird's eye view of what's going on for the entire multi-story shear wall assemblage. But when it comes to drilling down to the individual results, what I'm going to do is be looking at the individual tabs. So when it comes to deflection, this is all based on starting with the assumption that the wall is fixed from rotating at the base and it isn't allowed to move. And so we know at the very bottom we have a deflection of zero and also you can tell by the slope of this deflection plot here that it's also straight up and down uh, where it hits the, uh, the foundation there. So we're starting with zero there as well. Looking at that first story, then we have loads that are applied to it and we have a resulting moment envelope that's being experienced there. And if I look at the deflection results, you'll see this is where I see all my different load cases. In this case, I just applied an earthquake load and some dead loads. And so I have an axial load that's factored 650 kilonewtons. This is my moment at the top and bottom. And the equations that I'm using to, uh, to calculate rotations and deflections are a function of these two moment values. This is based on the assumption that there are no loads applied between those locations. That's why these, uh, why it can basically be simplified to looking at these two terms. And then the stiffness values here. So I have an IE term, effective moment of inertia, and that reference uh, Young's modulus E. So since it's a 30 MPA unit, 850 times that F prime M of a grouted, fully grouted unit, 13 and a half, gives us that 11,475 MPA. And so to calculate EI effective, what I'm doing then is multiplying these two values together. So if I go back to this, to get my EI effective, I'm going to be doing this for each floor. So I have 1.79 times 10 to the 11, that's in millimeters to the power of four. 
and this is multiplied by 11,475. And then if I put that into my calculator, I get 2.054 times 10 to the 15. And that's Newton millimeters squared. Um, I'm not gonna be getting into the units as well just to keep this simple. So now that I have that effective stiffness, what I can do is calculate what the rotation is at the top of this first story. This is going to be important for when we are looking at the stories above because we'll no longer have zero rotation happening at the base of those upper stories. So to start with that, I'm going to do theta at the top. I'm just gonna do a little one there. And so the formula is uh, we're looking at the two moments. So the moment at the base, the moment at the top of story one. Uh, so in this case, if I look at my moment envelope, let me quickly find my mouse. So if I look at it, it actually shows up here as well, a factored moment at the top and at the bottom. So I'm going to be doing this for each of these. So you can see I have 1,460 kilonewton meters at the base of this section and the 900 at the very top. So then going back to here, uh, putting it into this rotation formula. So I have 1460 and keeping everything's, everything in newtons and millimeters, I'm gonna need to multiply this by 10 to the six. And at the top, I said it was 900. And then this is all going to be divided by two times that uh, effective stiffness. So two times 2.054. Make sure it's clear that the decimal there times 10 to the 15. And this is multiplied by the height. So the height, um, basically we're doing this in sections between the loads are applied. So when we're looking at these earthquake loads that are being applied, uh, they are uh, basically placing the structure at the height of each section of masonry, not at the actual floor location. So I have a load coming in right below that floor slab here, one here, one up here, and at the very top, it's not actually right at the very top of the wall, it's actually uh, at the top of that top story there. So it's just below the, that very top. So we'll get into that a little bit later. So the height difference though, even though these stories are each three meters tall, I actually have uh, 2.8 meters. So times 2,800 millimeters. And so that is gonna give me the rotation at the very top. So in this case, 1.6086 times 10 to the negative three. Now this isn't unitless, this is measured in radians, but it is a dimensionless uh, measurement. So that's, uh, if you look up basically uh, what a radian is, it's uh, arc length per uh, unit length of radius. And so these numbers, uh, I mean, we can write rad here if you like, uh, but these numbers can just be applied uh, as uh, dimensionless values. So getting into the deflection then, so the deflection at the top of story one, uh, the formula is similar in terms of those two same moments, but uh, Basically, through integration, you can come up with, uh, from the rotation, what the deflection is at the top of the story. So in this case, it's two times that bottom moment. So two times 1460 times 10 to the six plus 900 kilonewton meters. And this is all over six times that effective stiffness. to the 15. Now, if you have any questions about the derivation of uh, how I came up with these expressions, I mean, there are a lot of different ways that you can come up using superposition and other, you know, structural mechanic uh, things that you would have learned and you would have learned in school. And so I'm not going to be getting into that here just for the sake of time. So this is going to be multiplied by h squared. And so the height that I'm using, uh, same as here, it's the height that we're looking at. So at, the, at this location here, where this load is applied, um, I'm going to have 2,800 squared. And so that is going to equal 2.4301 millimeters. Perfect. So now that I have this, I can go ahead and start looking at story number two. So I'll start here. Story two. And I'm going to come EI effective again. So in this case, EI effective. I need to get these two values from mass once again. So if I find my mouse, we're going to look at story two. So clicking on here and clicking on deflection, I have these values here. So our axial load is lower. And that's actually why we're going to see a difference in effective stiffness that comes up here. So even though it's the same cross section, 
The bending stiffness, it's going to be a little bit less stiff because we have less axial load that acts as almost like a clamping force that um, it stiffens up the, this member. So this is just taken from the uh, CSA S304 design standard and uh, part of clause 16 gives us that effective expression that we can use. So you can see we have 1.681 times 10 to the 11 and then we have that same uh, reference Young's modulus. So then going back to our notes here, if I put these values in, so I have 1.681 times 10 to the 11, multiplied by that 11, 4, 7, 5. And so that is going to give us a story two effective bending stiffness of 1.928, uh, 928 rather. 1.928, and that is times 10 to the 15. 10 to the 15. So now we have our effective bending stiffness for what's happening in this section of the wall here. So what we can do is we can go ahead and calculate what the rotation is. So theta at the top of two. And we have different moments now. So you recall 9450 were our two values in uh, kilonewton meters. So we have 900 times 10 to the six. And this is all divided by two EI effective. So two times this new value that we calculated here, our effective bending stiffness, 1.928 times 10 to the 15. And now we're talking about a height difference uh, between, since we're looking at it right here, uh, we actually have another floor slab uh, below this story, um, above this uh, location we calculated it before. So even though the, the clear height here is 2.8 meters, these loads are applied three meters apart. And so just for simplicity and to reduce the number of steps when it comes to the checking this, uh, we have assumed the same bending stiffness just in the floor slab for the area in the middle. Uh, we believe this is conservative uh, as you'll realistically have much, much higher bending stiffnesses that occur there. We have a short article about it. Call Steam to see if you have any questions about that. But that is why the height that I'm using is now three meters. And then on top of that, we have some rotation at the bottom here that we calculated. So we can't forget to add that 1.6086 times 10 to the negative three. And then uh, if we go through and calculate that, uh, so this first term here, so this is the amount of additional rotation that's happening. So we have 1.50, oh, sorry, 0 0.5, dyslexic here, 0. 503 times 10 to the negative 3 happening here, plus our rotation that's coming in at the base. So that's the same 1.6086. I like to break these apart just because if you make a mistake, it's easier to go back and find exactly where that happened. And so that's where I get my rotation that's occurring at this height here at the top of 2.6589. And that is times 10 to the negative three radians. Perfect, and so we can also calculate the deflection, how much movement we have. Um, I just wanna point out again, I haven't really gotten it too far into this, but we're dealing with just the elastic movement here. So these still need to be converted into drift values using the uh, expression of the building code. So the deflection at the top of story two, uh, same formula shown there. So uh, two times that base moment. So in this case, 900 times 10 to the six, plus 450. That's the moment at the top, times 10 to the six. And we're going to go through and divide this by six times our EI effective, so 1.928 times 10 to the 15. And the same height here, but it's height squared. Now, another thing that we need to take into account when I go through is looking at how, at the actual behavior here. Oops, I'll move this here. We have uh, different components of the rotation. As soon as we get up above the base story, like I said before, we're, this isn't a realistic profile. Basically, this is the deflected shape you would have if you didn't take into account any rotation that's occurring between the floors. So to take that into account, basically we have three different components. And I've broken them up here. I have uh, delta naught, Delta is a function of your rotation, and then delta I, which is the additional movement or displacement that we have uh, based on the loading, the moment that, that is occurring between these. So 
we already calculated how much the bottom is moving. That's the delta naught. And this delta I is, if I move this a little bit out of the way, uh, that's this term up here, this top one. And then we also can't forget to account for, if we just continue whatever deflection we, or rotation we, uh, we had at, at the top of the previous story, basically multiplying that value by, uh, by the height difference, that is going to give us this delta as a function of uh, rotation that we have here. And so what, I'm just going to move this out of the way. So we just can't forget. I'm going to kind of squish this down here. So this is the first term. Um, and so on top of that, I'm going to add uh, 1.6086 times 10 to the negative 3. That's that rotation that was here. And then I'm also going to multiply that by the height. And then we can't forget to add this base uh, movement as well. So I'm also going to add 2.4301 millimeters. And so if we add these together, I'm still going to calculate these individually just to keep them separated. So this first term, 2 times the bottom moment plus the top moment over 6ei effective times h squared, that uh, term right there is going to give us 1.7505 millimeters. Plus we have uh, this rotation term here. So this rotation times the height. Uh, that is going to be a, a much bigger number because we have a fair bit of rotation happening from the base of the wall up the top of that first story. And so that is actually going to give us, if you put that into your calculator, uh, almost 5 millimeters. So 4.8258. I'm carrying way too many significant digits here just to go ahead and check this. And then we have that 2.43 millimeters. So if we add all this together, it's the same as adding these values. This is going to give us a value of uh, just over nine millimeters. So I've got 9.00, try a little bit better, 6.4. And so this is the elastic deflection at the top of story number two that we have here. Okay, now looking over at story three now, story three, we're gonna have a different stiffness because we have less axial load ha happening here. So this EI effective term is going to take into account a different, even though it's the same cross-section, uh, that lower axial load is going to change that IE more than likely. So if we look at story three, look at the deflection tab, I'm just looking at the simplified results. So you'll see we have an even lower IE value, uh, same E reference value, because we have the same uh, routed strength of masonry, like I said, same cross-section. And now our moments are different. So we have 450 kilonewton meters happening at the base and then 150 at the top. And so that's gonna change that as well. So if we go back to our file here with those values that we looked at. So first of all, we have 1.572 times 10 to the 11 uh, millimeters to the four and multiplied by that same reference Young's module. So 11,475. And that is going to give us an effective stiffness for that third story of 1.804804 times 10 to the 15. So you'll see we're getting a little bit less stiff as a result of less axial load that's being applied on these stories. So now I'm going to go through and I'm going to calculate the rotation at the top of this just because I have enough information here to do that. So rotation at the top of story three. Uh, same expression here. So we're going to have 450 kilonewton meters plus we have 150 at the top and this is over 2 times EI effective over a very straight line so 2 times 1.804 and the same height difference here I in this file I just broke it up evenly so this is going to be uh, all multiplied by that same 3 meter height difference so one clear height, plus we have one floor thickness in the middle here. And we cannot forget to add the initial rotation at the base of, of story three as well that we calculated. So we are going to have that initial 2.6589 times 10 to the negative three. Okay, so if we go through and do that, I'm going to do just that first term once again to keep them separated. So I have four... Uh, basically just about 5 times 10 to the negative 4, so 4.989 times 10 to the negative 4. So we're getting into even lower values now, plus that initial 
2.6589 times 10 to the negative 3. So that is going to give us a total rotation, 3.151578 times 10 to the negative 3. And that is our rotation happening there. And now I can go ahead and do the same thing for deflection. So delta at the top of 3. So 2 times that top moment, 450. And we have 150 at the base. And this is over 6 CI effective. 6 multiplied by 1.804. Times 10 to the 15. And now we have h squared, 3 meters squared. Uh, so that's the, just from the moment experienced in that section, that's how much additional deflection that we have. On top of that, we can't forget the rotating of the base is going to have an effect as well. And so we calculated this rotation at the top of story 2, so 2.65. Eight, 9 times 10 to the negative 3 multiplied over that height that we're looking at. And then we also, so we have the initial rotation, we also have this, the initial movement. So that's nine millimeters that we have here. So we have the 9.0064. I know this is kind of confusing, but just hang with me here the way that I have it written. I'm trying to squish a lot into a small space, so I apologize for that. So if we go through and I do these terms one at a time, uh, the actual, from the moment that's occurring here, you see these, these actual moments are quite a bit lower as we work our way up the wall. And so we only have about 0.9 millimeters happening here. So actually 0 0.87, it's actually from the moment experience there. But if we look at that rotate that rotation term now, we're getting into larger numbers. So we have an additional, if you multiply this rotation times three meters, what we end up getting is 7.9767. So a much larger number from the base rotation. And then we have our base deflection, that nine millimeters, so plus nine, zero, zero, six, four. So if we add those all together, we get 7.85, or seven, sorry, 17.85. Point eight five six two millimeters. Perfect, and so that is how much elastic deflection we have now at the top of story three. And so what we can do is we can move on to story four. Story number four. So we're going to have another effective stiffness. There is a lower bound for this expression in the S304. So sometimes you might not see a difference between all of your stories, just depending on how close you are to the cracked or the uncracked stiffness. Uh, but in this case, so we need to get our new uh, IE and E ref values from, uh, from, we can get that just from mass. So we click on story four, simplified deflection tab gives you this result. So you can see at the very top of this, sure, well, this is the top of our wall. And so we wouldn't expect to have any moment there. But if I look at the moment drawing, it actually it starts at zero and goes all the way. Um, for deflection, we're looking at 150. Um, but actually for the shear wall portion, it's only being designed for 140. And that is just because if I go back to the moment results, it's only being designed for 140 here because we also have 200 millimeters of floor slab thickness. And so just like I said before, continuing that stiffness down, um, that is how we come up with these numbers. And so we have 1.463 times 10 to the 11. That is our IE value. And we have a reference, this E ref value of 11,475. So just to keep things rolling here, I'm going to multiply those together. So 1.463. 10 to the 11, 11 to 475. So we multiply these together. We're going to have another effective stiffness. 1.6788, 10 to the 15. Not super consistent with the number of significant digits here, but if I calculate this top rotation now, theta top of story four. So remember the moment at the top is, is zero, and at the base we have 150. So one. 50 kilonewton meters times 10 to the 6 plus 0. And that's going to be over 2 times its effective stiffness times 10 to the 15 multiplied by another 3 
meter height difference. And we have to add the rotation that we have coming from the base. So that's three, that's this number that we have here, 3.16, one, five, seven, eight times 10 to the negative three. So if we go through, we punch that into our calculator, uh, this first term, so the amount of additional rotation, once again, very low numbers, 1.3402 times 10 to the negative four, and then plus that 3.1578 times 10 to the negative three. We add those two numbers together to get our 3.29 one eight times 10 to the negative three. So for those of you following at home, hopefully you got the same numbers there. And then the deflection at the very top of story four, the elastic deflection, so same formula, getting a little repetitive. So two times that base moment, 150 times 10 to the six, zero moment at the top. So we can just put in zero there, over six EI effective. So six, one, 8, 8 times 10 to the 15, 3 meters squared. We can't forget the base rotation of story 4. So we have 3.1578 times 10 to the negative 3 multiplied by the 3 meter height difference that we're looking at. And then we have our base deflection we calculated here. So 17.8562. You don't need to carry as many digits as I'm carrying here. Like I said, not the best scientific notation. But in any case, if we add those numbers together, um, I'll spare you writing down the different terms individually. Um, but we end up with a 27.595976 millimeters is the number that we get here. And actually, the way um, this first term uh, just so you know, it only works out to about 0.3 millimeters um, out of this value that you see here. You can see about two-thirds of it is coming from just how much movement we already have for these bottom three stories, uh, which makes some intuitive sense. Uh, but we have another nine millimeters or so coming from the base rotation. So basically, as you move up the height of your shear wall, um, it's not unusual to basically see these numbers uh, start accumulating even more so. So... Um, there's just one more thing in terms of the elastic deflection that I'd like to point out here. So if I scroll up just a little bit to give myself a little bit more room, uh, we have the roof slab that's moving as well here. So uh, we have the rotation of that roof slab. So roof. And what I'm talking about here is specifically, if I bring up the mass file, go back to the multi-story section, so if we look at our shear wall, we've calculated exactly what the, uh, the elastic movement is all the way up to this location here uh, where the top load is applied. So there is no moment occurring at this upper 200 millimeters of a floor slab. That being said, um, even though we don't have to do any, um, any sort of uh, rotation or deflection with stiffness, there is a rotation occurring at the top. And so we basically need to carry that through an additional floor slab thickness to figure out, okay, how much more do we, uh, how much more does it rotate? So we figured out how much um, rotation we have. We have that 3.2918 times 10 to the negative three. And if we multiply that by our floor slab thickness, 200 millimeters, that gets us an additional, in this case, 0 0.66 millimeters, 0 0.6584 millimeters and that is additional deflection and so if we go back to this number here and we add that 0 0.6584 we actually get a new value of 0 point or 28 millimeters so 28 and that's 0 And so now that we have these, we've figured out exactly what the elastic movement is at this point. Um, the important part to come up with the answers that are used in the software when we're looking at this are actually converting these values to drifts. And so if I go all the way down here, we need to convert these numbers. If I, I'll bring this over here. 
these numbers that you see here, we've calculated the elastic um, delta, that elastic deflection, using the formula here, but then we have, uh, we basically have to multiply that by RDR naught divided by the importance factor. And that is what is gonna give us our actual drift. Uh, this is based on something called the equal displacement uh, theory. And so if you think about it, when we were calculating our seismic loads at the very beginning of the design process, even before the scope of what I was looking at in this video, uh, seismic loads are divided by RD and RO. So our ductility and our overstrength SFRS factors. And so, just for the purposes of finding uh, what the drift is, we basically need to undo that reduction that we've done in the loads. So we're not designing for those full loads. We do get to absorb some load from overstrength effects from ductility. But just when we're checking movement, we just basically need to undo that reduction. And so that's why what you have here is multiplying uh, what we calculated here with the elastic. We know it the entire way up the height of our shear wall now, uh, going up stories one through four. And so we basically need to multiply them by RD, RO divided by IE, and that gives us an actual drift. So now if I go back here, so for all of these values, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to uh, do this in green here. So if we take uh, this movement at the very, very top of our shear wall, and we multiply this by RD, RO over IE, if I'm just looking at an important uh, normal importance category in this case, i.e. is one. And uh, in this example in particular, we're talking about con conventional construction. And so RD is equal to 1.5 and RO is equal to 1.5 as well. If this wall were unreinforced, we'd be looking at one and one, no ductility, no overstrength. And if it were moderately ductile, we'd get into higher values of RD where this RO would be still be staying at 1.5. So just to keep things rolling here, this um, elastic deflection that we calculated, 28 uh, millimeters, this actually goes all the way up. So if we multiply it by 1.5, uh, which is our RD, and I'll multiply it by 1.5 again, uh, which is our overstrength factor, this gets us all the way to 63 point, whoops, 63.5756 millimeters. And we can do this for all of these values, actually. So if we, uh, the, at the top of this story, we, we calculated 17.856. And so if we multiplied that by RD, RO over IE, what we get is that 17 millimeters goes all the way up to 40.1763. 40 Going down to story number two. So same thing, we can look at this nine millimeters multiply that by RD, RO over IE. And that nine millimeters becomes 20.2644. And then last but not least, this 2.43, very small value that we're talking about here. RD, RO over IE. This becomes 5.46. Seven, seven millimeters. So now we've got all the way up the height at the very top. Uh, we know we have uh, almost 64 millimeters of movement that is occurring here. So if I open up the software and we look at our deflection, these are the values that you see here. So they've already been scaled up from the elastic values. This only gets done for seismic load cases uh, because that's the only uh, load cases that we're concerned about drift anyways. And then if we look here, um, just for the multi-story, not too much information is shown here. Um, however, the rotation and the deflection is, is uh, shown, that, and these were the values that we calculated. And the inner story drift is the value that we're worried about. So uh, in this case, since it's a normal importance factor, we're looking at 2.5% is what the limit is. And even though the shear wall is loaded pretty much right to its capacity, if we look at the PM diagram, it's conventional construction, so our axial load is capped, but we're right near the edge of the envelope curve. But if you look at our drift values, even at the very top where we have the most um, curvature of our wall, that rotation, we're still only looking at 0.84%. So we're uh, a very small fraction of what the limit is. And when you think about it, masonry is uh, fairly stiff, fairly rigid. And so with these types of SFRS um, designs, uh, drift doesn't tend to be uh, the issue that you run into with these sorts of things. So in any case, I really hope that this has been uh, helpful for you. Um, I apologize, uh, it was a little bit messy, but um, hopefully this sheds a little bit of light on, on how the software comes up with the, uh, the drift values, how we go about calculating deflection. 
Um, for those of you uh, keeping track at home, looking for bonus points, you may have noticed with these expressions, there is no shear deformation um, that's taken into account. It's all bending. Um, you start to have a lot more shear deflection effects when you get into lower aspect ratio walls. And so when we're dealing with multi-story design, uh, this factor tends to get very low. Uh, but the other reason, uh, probably the biggest reason why we didn't include it in the mass software, even though in Shearline we do have it as one of the uh, components, is that there really is no consensus on how we can do that for partially grouted walls. Uh, we can look at it for hollow and for fully grouted, but as soon as you get to partially grouted, um, there's just no consensus on how we can go about calculating that. And so we just wanted to basically try and take the approach that would be the easiest to explain and uh, the most defensible. And so, um, like I said, um, especially with the... Uh, looking at the assumptions for stiffness, let's say at slab locations and things like that, we've tried to do our best to calculate a fairly accurate drift um, that follows a, a method outlined in the CSA S304 and the National Building Code. Um, but at the same time, be a little bit conservative for things, um, in particular the slab thicknesses and things like that. Uh, but if you have any other questions, if uh, you have any feedback for me sort of going through and doing this, feel free to uh, contact the Canada Maester Design Center. We are available to offer technical support if you have any questions with the mass software, if you have any issues, maybe you found a bug or something, feel free just to send it over to us. We do maintain the software. Uh, the Canada Mason Design Center is the authorized technical support provider uh, for the mass software. So just call our office and uh, chances are we'll just be able to uh, quickly get you on your way, but we're happy to step into these calculations as well. And so if you have any questions about these, feel free, just contact CMDC. Thank you.